My name's Monkey, or my nickname's Monkey. I'm 30. I'm working as a secretary. And I wanted to take part in this interview because I don't think drugs are bad. I think it would be good to show someone who has got a job and um, can, is taking drugs on a regular basis, illegal drugs, um, but is still managing to sustain a life, pay the rent, and is basically a, as good a person as she can try to be. In, in an ideal world, I would be completely identified. You'd see my face, I could give you my name, because I have no shame about taking drugs. But I love my parents, I love my family, and if by some association they, um, they found out about this um, or were targeted, targeted in some way because of this, um, I wouldn't be happy with that because I love and respect them. From when they were growing up, I think childhoods were a lot more innocent, especially as they both grew up in Sri Lanka. Um, my mum came here when she was 11. My grandma was very strict, didn't let her go out. And my dad came over here for university, so there was drinking, but he's never been an extreme drinker of any kind. I don't think I had a proper drink until I was about 17, and then that was the age that I started going to pubs. So I think it surprised them to see me going out and getting quite plastered and sort of rolling in at midnight drunk. Um, so I did get lectures, but there was nothing in, er sort of in earlier life, no warnings or anything. As far as my parents know, um, I haven't tried any, uh, any illegal drugs other than smoking weed. We used to have lessons at school occasionally, discussing these kind of things. And when it came to um, drinking, health, um, sex, I got good information at school. But there was still nothing particularly on drugs. There was never that Ask Frank that, you know, that they've got. When I was at school, there was no internet, so we didn't look things up. It was just what leaflets you were given. My mum's always been really anti-smoking. Um, when I was younger, I had really, really bad asthma. <laughs> um, had some treatments for it, and if I hadn't started smoking, I wouldn't need um, a salbutamol inhaler, like a reliever, um, every so often. Um, I tried my first cigarette at 13, at a school disco, and I have to say, it tasted fabulous. <laughs> um, girls at school tried to make me into one of those lunchtime smokers, and it just struck me struck me as pointless because you couldn't buy them officially at, at sort of 13, 14. Um, you had to hide under a tree. They were all spraying themselves with impulse, and so you knew what they were up to. When I had my first spliff, it was with my best friend at the time, so safe, comfortable people, and um, her boyfriend, who was a few years older, and it was at his mum's house, and she didn't mind him smoking. We were in a safe environment. We weren't on some street corner um, or in a bike shed or something like that. We were in, you know, a normal domestic environment. Alcohol's definitely worse than cannabis. Um, if I could have not had a first drink and done the drinking years of my life and swapped it for being a stoner, sort of, you know, if you could change the past, then I'd do that in a heartbeat. My mum found out, I, I think I told her that I was smoking weed, smoking hash, um, because there was a, a news story on the BBC about skunk, about the effects it has um, to do with schizophrenia, and she was very concerned. Um, I had to explain to her that I don't smoke skunk. She still disapproves, but she accepts that it's a choice that I've made. I won't smoke skunk again. I don't know what it is about it being a stronger strain of the plant, but the difference between smoking skunk and smoking hash um, or something um, gentle and homegrown, the difference is, is amazing um, between the amount of paranoia you have, um, between how much you want to keep smoking, keep smoking, and um, I suppose get more addicted to having it all the time. I looked it up just off, after seeing the advert for their marijuana advert, all these chaps come around, some of them are friendly, some of them have memory loss. Um, I had a look on there and looked up weed and 
some of the, I would say about 40 to 50 percent of the advice is actually quite good. It's quite straightforward. And if I was a teenager, it's, um, it's, it's got some information on it. But the tone is so, do not do this, it's bad. If you have a spliff, you have, if you have one spliff, you're going to get schizophrenia. Um, and if you know, if you have one pill, you know, your world is going to end. It's not a balanced view of, um, of the good that drugs can do and the fun you can have on them. And it doesn't tell you how to have fun on them. It just tells you not to do them. As a teenager, if someone tells you not to do something, you're going to give it a go. And, um, and I've always been a, no, I'll try it once and I'll probably try it a second time just to make sure. I've always tried to make sure that if I've tried something for the first time, it's because I want to do it. And the only time that I didn't, I paid for it. And it did go wrong because I wasn't in a safe, comfortable space. Um, I wasn't um, in a familiar environment. I didn't know what I was taking and how much I was taking. It was mushrooms. Um, and that was when I was about 25. Um, and I had just started college. I went back to college and um, was friends with some lads. It was one of their birthdays. He wanted to try mushrooms for the first time. So we went back to his house and it all, I knew him and then there were all his mates and there was this chameleon lizard thing in the room. And I had one cup of mushroom tea and the others all started giggling and, and tripping and um, nothing was happening. So the guy who was making the tea said, well, do you want another cup? And I was like, I'm not sure, I'm not sure, because I'm only little, you don't know, it, it, and also I've never had them before. He's like, go on, go on, it'll, it'll, you'll, it'll come up faster, you'll be on the same level as us. And I, by the time I finished this second mug of tea, the wallpaper was coming to get me. And we were watching this guitarist on TV and he had too many fingers. And then I suddenly realized that I couldn't understand a word anyone was saying. And I, start, I did start freaking out because I just thought if I feel if something goes wrong and everyone's talking gobbledygook, how on earth am I going to express that something's wrong? One of the chaps there was actually really good and just stayed with me, calmed me down, got me outside where it was better. But I couldn't let go of his hand for the rest of the night. I was still so scared. And I've tried mushrooms since, but I, I feel paranoid on them now, even when I'm with close friends. So I just don't, I've given up on them. I wish I could get off the tobacco, but part of me just enjoys it far too much. Um, I drink very rarely. It's pretty much down to rum now. Beer is the nastiest thing in the whole world. I worked in a bar for two years and you could tell who was going to give you trouble by the kind of beer they were drinking every single Friday night without fail. If you're on the Stella, I don't want you at my bar. Acid is by far my favourite drug, that and smoking some hash. Um, just for what it does to your mind, I find if I've got a lot on my mind and I have a weekend on acid with some friends, I can untangle the threads in my head of all these different things that I'm thinking about. It enhances colour and shape, so the things that you're seeing are either hilarious or beautiful. The things that it does to music are just astounding. Um, and uh, other than being tired, because you've been awake for, sort of, you know, for 12, 24 hours, it, there's a very harmless come down. Um, and I really love smoking weed. I smoke it every day, like, Minimum one, maximum if there's friends around, maybe five, six um, spliffs. Because I prefer a slower, more relaxed way of life, it doesn't impact on my life. I think if I wanted to be a busy person, constantly doing things, constantly busy um, and doing achieving every day, then perhaps I would smoke less or not, not at all. Now that I've actually realised recently if I get caught with a spliff, I can minimum get cautioned, maximum go to jail for what, is it 12, 12 to 18 months? Um, if you're caught with about an eighth, that's freaked me right out. What am I doing that's harming anyone? I'm not being violent, I'm not stealing anything, I'm not getting in anyone's face, and if I'm around children, I am not gonna smoke weed. 
And if I'm, you know, walking through a park and there's a playground, I'm not going to sit in a playground and smoke, even a cigarette. If I can have those kind of morals, why is what I'm doing illegal? I don't think the government are targeting the right drugs if they want an ordered, controlled society. And they have criminalised a drug that makes people calm and more relaxed and more open, in my opinion. I think there should be more restrictions on alcohol, especially with driving. That's my biggest thing, from working in a pub. And this is a pub in a very, um, you could say, a Daily Mail. It's home county's pub out in a little village. And the amount of people I've seen driving home absolutely wasted on alcohol. And if they hit someone, they, they'll kill them. Start cutting down to the point of possibly not buying any if all that's left is skunk. One day I'd love it if I could have some in my garden and grow my own. Um, and I feel really sad that I can't because gardening is a lovely thing. And if I could be growing my own smoke, that seems so self-sustainable. It seems far better from getting it from a dealer because there is the little worry at the back of my head. Where, you know, where's the source? How are they getting it in the country? You know, are these, in, are these normal, nice, everyday chaps who are going to get in trouble for getting me my smoke into the country? Or is it some nasty, you know, is it a Daily Mail dealer who's trafficking in, in children and hash? You know, you, you, you don't know. By the time I had heard, heard about ketamine, I had had my days of doing some speed. We were doing that up in Manchester maybe every weekend and going clubbing, and it was lovely. But the, the come downs, like the week after, was getting quite bad. And suddenly pills were everywhere. And I did too, like, uh, I've got a horrible history of doing it too much and then realising and then stopping. And um, that happened. And then I heard people were doing ketamine and I saw friends at a party and they were slumped in a corner on the floor with their eyes closed, not dancing, not interacting. And I just thought, how can that be any fun at all? I didn't like the fact that they looked like they were unconscious. But you'd go over and sort of just shake them and they'd be like, no, no, I'm, I'm on the K, oh, it'll be all right, just leave me alone, leave me alone. And drugs shouldn't be about leave me alone. Drugs should be about come over here and, and, and let's enjoy ourselves together. Then I found people who were doing very small amounts in, in this little device, a little bullet. It gives you a measured dose um, for quite very small, like the end of a line, um, with each sniff. So I tried it. And it was amazing. <laughs> it's like how how they some psychedelic sixties films show acid and tripping and, and things like that and things go cartoony and you you're always wondering in the back of your mind when it's gonna go like that and that is what ketamine does. Such a disassociative the the, w the way it re you react to music and to um, the pictures that go on in your mind when your eyes are closed, you see things behind your eye eyelids, it's just lovely. The first time does send you into that hole, but I was with my boyfriend at the time, I was with, again, with safe people in a comfortable environment. We were in a bedroom where everything was squashy, no sharp corners. <laughs> After that, when you take another one of those small hits, um, you don't fall into the hole so much. Now, I can take a small amount, go clubbing, dance. Um, the music's just incredible on ketamine. Um, and it makes everything really funny. And you get very chatty and there's lots of lovely nonsense being spoken between friends. Um, and I do like it. But it is, it is a drug that must be treated with caution and respect. It's the only psychoactive drug, it's the only trippy drug that your body will get addicted to. Acid will just leave your body, mushrooms will just leave your body, but ketamine stays in there going, do you want some more, do you want some more? And I don't like that voice actually, so I, it's not a drug I'll ever have on my own. I do an ounce of, of weed a month, um, so, and that's 65 pounds. Um, and it is the cheapest stuff you can get. Um, but it lasts, so it's fantastic. Um, there were two major party weekends, and I had a gram of K at each, and that was £15 the first time, and it was £20 the next time. And I think I chipped in about a fiver 
towards um, each time towards um, balloons, nitrous balloons. And it goes up if there's more parties, definitely. But the circle of friends that I got, that I, that I have, we tend to all chip in rather than each of us getting a gram. There's, it, it, there's not as much excess. In these times of recession, yeah, we're all chipping in towards a gram or, or chipping in towards balloons. So doesn't that make the person who's accessing, who's securing the drugs for all of you, that's they're they're a dealer? Oh, I suppose so. It's that's quite funny actually. I hadn't thought of that because you think about the person you buy it off, who you make the the total money exchange with, as the dealer. Um, but I have to say, I'm n I haven't had a dealer who's been anonymous. I've always tried to make sure that I know the person at least a little bit before I am getting drugs off them. I have a friend who kindly agreed to sort out all the party ingredients for everyone for a festival. And there were about five of them, but it's a festival weekend, so he had weed, acid and pills on him. And it wasn't a lot of acid, it was, I think, a tab each. And it wasn't a lot of pills, it was maybe about sort of 10, 15, which between five people is not very much, and maybe maybe about two or three ounces of weed. But he got caught with all of it. Now, this boy is the geekiest boy that you've ever met. You, you, he couldn't hurt a fly. And he's no criminal. You know, everyone who he was getting things for are all working in real jobs. None of them are on the scrounge in any way, shape or form. None of them are living with their parents, scrounging off their parents. They're all, you know, renting their own places. And they want to get things that will intoxicate them that aren't available in Sainsbury's. And he's gone down for 18 months. And what's going to happen to that boy in prison? He's, he's a well-educated young man and he's going to be in prison for 18 months. And it's sick. And I, it's scary because, because I, ha I have to be friends with someone almost if I want to get drugs off them because you've got to establish trust and, and fairness. And quite oft more often than not, they're people who you want to hang out with and might be taking these drugs with. And then to think of them going to prison, to think of me going to prison, is frightening. If you're not harming another person, we're all doing this through choice. I would never pressure anyone into taking things they didn't want to. And if I saw that happening, I would stop it. And there's been quite a few times I've gone up to someone and gone, hang on a minute, do you know what you're taking? Hang on a minute, is it the first time that you're trying this? You know, do you want me to sit with you and take you through it? because I really like doing it. <laughs> um, it is a lot of fun taking drugs. I don't see a huge difference between the legalized drugs and the illegal drugs. And I, I think that we're being victimized because there's people out there who don't want you to have fun and who want too much control over other people. If they legalized it, Right. If they legalise drugs, say they legalised hash, you would be able to take a tax off it and that tax would go to police and councils and schools and roads and traffic wardens, which are all the same things that your da average Daily Mail reader is contributing towards with their alcohol tax. Yes, I do. I think post-alcohol that 17, 17 to maybe age 19 period was when I realised that I had an addictive personality. So it's keeping a control on every aspect of my life, which includes keeping a control over the drugs. Um, it's not easy. Um, I have had to watch myself over ketamine because I did notice that I, in certain company, it's too easy to, t to go for a bigger and bigger line instead of just sticking to that little bullet. And so I gave myself a month off it in January and started from the beginning again. And um, for the past few months, I've just only been having those small amounts. So it is dangerous, um, which is why there should be more information and drugs should be treated with respect, including alcohol, caffeine and tobacco. If I was bringing up some kids, it would be important to me to be open with them 
about the drugs that are out there, the ones that I might be taking, the ones that other people are taking. As I get older, I think it's more and more important that many, many drugs should not be tried until you're over 18 because there's just too much important stuff growing in your brain. But they should be, they should know it's out there. You should know it's out there so that you can build up your information and look forward to something happening rather than not know, suddenly find out, suddenly think it's good, suddenly realise it's bad. Because by the time that cycle's finished, you might be in a really bad place in your life. Around about age eight or nine, um, when we moved to Kent, um, that's when I first started having suicidal thoughts and that went on through school. Didn't really tell anyone about it. Um, and then it, we got to the sixth form and I was proper, I think I was properly depressed um, and ended up going to the doctors um, after an incident. And um, the doctor arranged for a counsellor. Um, and I must have been about 18 because it was after I'd had my first spliff and had been stoned maybe about, I don't know, five, six times, not hugely often. And I remember speaking to this counsellor chap who must have been in his, in his 40s or so and me, 18, meeting up at school in a room off the common room and him asking me whether I'd um, tried any drink or drugs and I mentioned alcohol and then I mentioned the weed and as soon as I did, his attitude changed towards one of, oh, this must be one of the causes. Um... And I saw him once more, and then, because I felt uncomfortable with him, I didn't see him again. Fast forward to about age 22, 23, and having panic attacks and big periods of depression, um, I do think it was exa exacerbated by the amount of skunk I was smoking and by the amount of pills that I was doing as well at that time. But again got referred to a psychologist on the NHS. Again, you'd say about your childhood, about the feelings that you'd have when you were younger, about how those feelings were building up, and then they'd ask about drug use, and um, you'd explain about drug use, and then that would be the cause of your problems, which is a factor, but it isn't the cause. I was um, prescribed um, Siroxat, um, so at age 22, 23, um, where, which made me more suicidal than I think I'd ever felt before. At that time, um, I self-harmed, which I'd never done before. And then a fo the following year, um, it was in the news, it was in all the newspapers about how Siroxa affects um, young people under 25. A friend of mine referred me to um, a private therapist, which I had to pay for, best money I ever spent. Um, I ended up through my own choice, not telling her about my drug use to see whether the things she was telling me would still help. I was um, in therapy for two and a half years and during that time I was still taking ketamine, um, still smoking the same amount of weed that I am now um, and um, having the odd acid trip, um, but getting better from my depression. And, and with no antidepressants as well, still continuing the drug use, having a form of therapy where it addressed the issues from my childhood and changed myself and improved the way that my brain works. I'd rather um, sort of self-medicate, I suppose. Um, and if it's funny because that Ask Frank thing <clears throat> shows the guy getting stoned and then feeling panicky, whereas... I find, and I, I can't speak for anyone else, but I find that if I'm panicky and I have a smoke, then I'm able to go out. I get the feeling that they don't get this kind of information either. Um, they've been trained to hear um, the words ecstasy or weed or ketamine and instantly think, ah, oh, right, that affects certain things in the brain and it makes everything go wrong because they're illegal, so they're definitely making things go wrong. Alcohol and tobacco <clears throat> and even caffeine um, may have similar effects and they may address those as well, um, but it's more acceptable. It's like, here's all the help you can get to, to get off um, nicotine and to understand these things better. But when it comes to illegal drugs, they don't have the information either. 
I don't know. I find that the way we live our lives in this world encourages stress and unhappiness unless you can find some things to sort of alleviate that. Um, it'd be lovely not to have to take anything unless it truly tasted nice or made you happy. But I have to say, I do find that spliffs are very tasty and they really make me happy. I don't know what kind of world it would have to be for me not to take drugs, a world with no drugs in it. But I, I can't have someone telling me not to do something when there's clearly not enough research, you know, when there's so many people saying it makes them happy and yet they're saying, no, don't do it. You could say, would I, would I want to live in a world without cake? And really, cake is lovely and tasty and gorgeous. But if you eat all of the cake, you're going to get obese. And that's, you can't do, you know, that's terrible. You might get heart disease, you might get diabetes. So don't have all of the cake, just have a bit. And it's the same with drugs. Don't have all of the drugs and, like, end up, you know, being really ill and sick. Just have a bit of the drugs and, and have a happy day. <laughs> and... If by some association they, um, they found out about this um, or were targeted, targeted in some way because of this, um, I wouldn't be happy with that because I love and respect them. From when they were growing up, I think childhoods were a lot more innocent, especially as they both grew up in Sri Lanka. Um, my mum came here when she was 11. My grandma was very strict, didn't let her go out and my dad came over here for university so there was drinking but he's never been an extreme drinker of any kind. I don't think I had a proper drink until I was about 17 and then that was the age that I drugs. There was never that ask Frank that you know that they've got. When I was at school there was no internet so we didn't look things up it was just what leaflets you were given. My mum's always been really anti-smoking um, when I was younger, I had really, really bad asthma, <laughs> um, had some treatments for it, and if I hadn't started smoking, I wouldn't need um, a salbutamol inhaler, like a reliever, um, every so often. Um, I tried my first cigarette at 13 at a school disco, and I have to say, it tasted fabulous. <laughs> um, girls at school tried to make me into one of those lunchtime smokers and it just struck me struck me as pointless because you couldn't buy them officially it started going to pubs so I think it surprised them to see me going out and getting quite plastered and sort of rolling in at midnight drunk um, so I did get lectures but there was nothing in a er sort of in earlier life no warnings or anything as far as my parents know um, I haven't tried any, uh, any illegal drugs other than smoking weed. We used to have lessons at school occasionally discussing these kind of things and when it came to um, drinking, health, um, sex, I got good information at school but there was still nothing particularly on drugs. My name's Monkey, or my nickname's Monkey. I'm 30, I'm working as a secretary, and I wanted to take part in this interview because I don't think drugs are bad. I think it would be good to show someone who has got a job and um, can, is taking drugs on a regular basis, illegal drugs, um, but is still managing to sustain a life, pay the rent, and is basically a, as good a person as she can try to be. In, in an ideal world, I would be completely identified. You'd see my face, I could give you my name, because I have no shame about taking drugs. But I love my parents, I love my family, sort of 13, 14. Um, you had to hide under a tree. They were all spraying themselves with impulse, and so you knew what they were up to. When I had my first spliff, it was with my best friend at the time, so safe, comfortable people, and um, her boyfriend, who was a few years older, and it was at his mum's house, and she didn't mind him smoking. We were in a safe environment. We weren't on some street corner um, or in a bike shed or something like that. We were in, you know, a normal domestic environment. Alcohol's definitely worse than cannabis. Um, 
if I could have not had a first drink and done the drinking years of my life and swapped it for being a stoner, sort of, you know, if you could change the past, then I'd 